Comb jellies are ancient animals and voracious carnivores that belong to the phylum Tenophora. This includes around 100 species. Their radially symmetric body contains eight rows of comb-like plates of fused cilia that beat in order for them to move through the water. The comb rows diffract light to create a rainbow display as they swim. Some comb jellies additionally exhibit bioluminescence, or the emission of light by chemical reactions. Their body is over 95% water. When taken out of water, they literally look like a blob of jelly. About half of the comb jelly species feed by the use of a pair of tentacles that do not sting, but instead contain sticky cells called chyloblasts. Zooplankton will stick to their tentacles and they will draw the prey into their mouth. They can extend their stomachs to hold prey half their size. Other comb jellies have no tentacles. Instead, their mouth contains hooks to bite off chunks of prey and secrete a poison to paralyze prey. They will even feed on other comb jellies larger than themselves. While the majority of tenophores swim, some species remain on the bottom creeping along the ocean floor or living on other animals. Most possess a gravity-sensitive structure called a statocyst that gives them a sense of up and down in the water. They have no brain but contain a loose network of nerves called the nerve net. Tenophores typically prefer warmer waters in temperate and tropical areas near the surface in both shallow and deep habitats. These jellies can be quite invasive and their swarms can drastically change ocean ecosystems. Overfishing has caused an increase in populations of tenophores because of less predation. All cone jellies are hermaphrodites. Eggs and sperm are cast into the water and fertilization takes place. Their larva grows rapidly as their entire lifespan is only around a few months. A full-size comb jelly can range from a few millimeters to over four feet. For more marine facts, click the subscribe button. Have you ever wanted to change the color of your eyes from brown to blue or green? That may not just be...
turns out that they are not immune to HIV after all, and they were born with versions of CCR5 that are unlikely to occur in any... the next episode of Engineering Wonders next week. In the meantime, check out our other original series. ...is essential in our pursuit of a regenerative circular economy. And sugarcane, the world's largest crop by production volume, results in hundreds of millions of tons of it a year, a fibrous byproduct called bagasse. In 2022, experts from the University of East London, Grimshaw and Tate and Lyle Sugar came together to investigate the viability of bagasse as an alternative to carbon-heavy construction materials like brick and concrete. So the research project is in a nutshell about taking the waste and using it as a core resource, treating it as an opportunity for us to decarbonize the construction industries. Material science, sustainable circular economies, and advanced design technology from academia and practice were integral to the research program. And that's why this project was amazing. It brought all of those strands together to produce a fantastic outcome. And a series of workshops using cutting-edge robotic fabrication and augmented reality technology led to the development of Sugarcrete. We're never going to be able to tackle the issues facing industry and society in isolation. We're always going to need to collaborate and communicate with others in the industry and with academia as well. This new material, created by binding bagasse with a mineral composite, can be compressed into blocks, has good structural, thermal, acoustic and fire properties. The main innovation with Sugarcrete is to challenge the common understanding of biomaterials having low structural performance and to develop a system that can be self-supported. The blocks, truncated pyramid forms, create a geometric solution that requires minimal reinforcement or mortar. This modular kit of parts, adopting a no-waste manufacturing process, can simply slot together to form walls, roofs or floor slabs. Sugar creates create a useful sustainable material it is also putting the power of construction into the hands of people in the community. Sustainable, versatile, reusable. From its origins as an abundant global bio-waste resource to its potential as an alternative construction material, this research by UEL and Grimshaw has demonstrated the far-reaching impacts that Sugar Creek can have.
An international team of researchers have been working at the White Sands National Park in New Mexico to determine the age of the footprint traces that occur so abundantly there. The human footprints are associated with Pleistocene megafauna and are found on the margins and bed of what was a lake. David Bustos, resources manager at the park, explains. For years we've been seeing um, really incredible fossil footprints of mammoth and people and camels and giant ground sloth, all kinds of incredible megafauna alongside uh, human prints throughout the park at different elevations. Um, sometimes the prints would be made of clay, sometimes made of dolomite, sometimes they were in a sandy material. For years we've been wondering how old are these human prints? Are they as old as the megafauna? To address the age of the footprint traces, a new excavation was made in January 2020 to reveal the stratigraphic context of the footprint layers. Kathleen Springer, working with Jeff Pegatti, both of the US Geological Survey, undertook the dating, as described by Kathleen. And our work involved a detailed stratigraphic analysis of the individual layers of this ancient lake that the human footprints are found in, and then dating the abundant seeds that occur on all of these horizons with radiocarbon. The significance of the site and work is outlined by Vance Holliday from the University of Arizona. It is now the oldest well-documented archaeological site in the Americas with evidence of human activity from about 23,000 to 21,000 years ago. That was during the last ice age in New Mexico. I'm Dan Otis from the National Park Service. This discovery is important because it confirms that humans were in North America much earlier than many people believe. Unlike other sites, where people disagree about whether broken stones and bones are products of human action, or they worry that younger artifacts might somehow have been introduced into older deposits. What we have at White Sands National Park are stratified layers containing indisputably human tracks alongside those of extinct Ice Age mammals. Major national technological advancements are happening right here in NEPA. Today, U.S. Representative Matt Cartwright, leaders of the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense, and several private companies all announcing a first-of-its-kind quantum and space technology collaboration. 2822 News reporter Amelia Sack is downtown Wilkesbury live tonight to explain. Amelia. Nick and Candace, good evening. Officials say that the collaboration is a part of a five-year plan which aims to accelerate the development of quantum technology for space and national defense efforts. And they say it's all starting here in the building behind me in the Diamond City. Building the future right here in our backyard. On Monday, officials came together at the Luzerne Bank building in downtown Wilkesbury for a major announcement. This was a, a terrific announcement of a, basically a consortium of government and business entities uh, to look into expanding quantum science and quantum research. Quantum technology explores how matter and energy behave at the level of atoms or subatomic particles. Officials say quantum science and technology has led to the development of things Things like GPS satellites, smartphones, and medical devices. Future advancements from the private-public partnership promise to improve space-based navigation, national security, and communications. The collaboration aims to bring more jobs to the area within the next several years. It means more economic opportunity for northeastern Pennsylvania. We can't say exactly what shape it's going to take, but it's about keeping your eye on the future. Representative Cartwright says our area's manufacturing industry has primed it to become an epicenter for the nation's quantum supply chain. We have so many people ready, willing, and able to work hard in manufacturing jobs around here, uh, and that's the kind of jobs that this sort of thing will lead to. One of the collaboration's partners, Nebula Space Enterprise, will house a center for space research and data at the Luzerne Bank building on Public Square in Wilkesbury, and will expand in the near future. The company's CEO and founder, Michael Bloxton, purchased the building last year. The community has, has done an amazing job of preparing some opportunity to come in. The company will work with the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. The collaboration also aims to bring in local universities and colleges and develop more quantum-based curriculum. Bloxton says this kind of collaboration is a first for the area and a first nationwide. No one else in the nation has truly stepped up to become the quantum supply chain for the nation. And that is a critical opportunity. It's actually a critical need and it's an amazing opportunity. And I can't think of a reason why we can't do it here in Wilkes-Barre, Northeast. 
Officials did not discuss too many specifics at today's news conference, but say that the work from the collaboration is set to begin in early 2024. In Wilkes-Barre, Luzerne County, Amelia Sack, 2822 News. Thank you, Amelia. and you're watching The Code Report. Imagine a futuristic utopia where you commute to your dead-end job on a magic levitating hover train, then hop on your hoverboard to meet up with your friends to make TikToks using Android phones that have nearly unlimited battery power, zero heat production, and use quantum chips that are a billion times faster than your current phone. That future may not be as far off as you think if we're to believe the South Korean scientist who recently claimed to have discovered a room temperature ambient pressure superconductor known as LK99. If it turns out to be true, this would easily be the greatest greatest scientific discovery of the 21st century. The only caveat, though, is that it might be total BS. They recently released two non-peer-reviewed papers, and scientists around the world are currently racing to reproduce their results. To understand why this is such a big deal, though, we need to stop pretending that we know what a superconductor is. A regular conductor is just a material that allows electricity or electrons to flow through it. Like aluminum in high-voltage transmission lines, or copper wires in your house, gold and silver if you're a baller, or even ionized gas like fluorescent light bulbs, not to mention salt water is a good conductor. The problem is that as electrons flow through these metals, they meet some resistance, and that resistance causes heat. That's why our computers need fans and heat sinks, and why power lines need to run at very high voltages. It's really not ideal. Now, superconductors are materials that can transfer electricity with zero resistance. That sounds awesome, but the problem is that they only work in super cold temperatures, like approaching absolute zero, or under extreme pressure, like ocean gate titan pressure. And that makes them nearly useless for all practical applications, with a few exceptions like highly specialized MRI machines. They also have interesting magnetic properties. In magnets, how do they work? Type 1 superconductors expel all magnetic fields when transitioning to a superconducting state, which is known as the Meissner effect. Then we've got type 2 superconductors that don't completely expel magnetic fields and can operate at relatively higher temperatures, which makes them more suitable for practical applications today. But LK99, if it's even legit, would completely change the superconductor game because it operates at room temperature with ambient air pressure. And surprisingly, cooking this stuff up isn't that difficult. You just take some lead oxide and some lead sulfate, heat it at 700 125 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, and that should give you some lanarkite. Then create some copper phosphide with a vacuum, mix them together and heat them up, and now you've got LK99. It's surprisingly simple, and the next 48 hours will be really interesting to see if other cooks can actually get this recipe to work. The practical use cases for such a material are impossible to understate. Electronics will become faster and more efficient. Medical tech will become cheaper and more accessible. It could open the door to things like quantum computing and frictionless transportation, and dramatically improve energy efficiency to the point where politicians don't need to feed us bugs to make the weather better. Now, before you get too excited and start investing all your money on levitating train stocks, many smart people out there are highly skeptical of this paper. By comparison, the highest temperature superconductors of today operate at negative 20 degrees Celsius and require pressures of 25 million PSI. And there's already a rabbit hole of drama surrounding the paper, like it looks like it may have been uploaded without everyone being on board, which might suggest some infighting between researchers. And just recently, another scientist had his paper taken down that had also claimed to discover a room temperature superconductor. I mean, I get it, everyone wants to be the next Alfred Einstein, and in rare cases, people might cherry-pick data or outright lie to get that clout. However, I'm keeping my fingers crossed for LK99 because I promised my kids a hoverboard for Christmas, and I really can't let them down again. This has been The Code Report. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Oh! Oh! There are few animals in nature that instill the same amount of disdain in humans as wasps. Besides causing emergency room visits around the world on a daily basis, these seemingly malicious insects have a tendency to build nests near urban areas in an impressively quick fashion. Being able to build nests this fast requires tremendous skill and coordination on the colony's part. And believe it or not, that same coordination inspired engineers to use their building methods for something truly extraordinary. This is Engineer's Muse, and today we are going to look at how wasps inspired 3D printing drones. They might not seem like it, but wasps are amazing communicators. Like many other species that are found in the wild, they use pheromones to keep in touch with the rest of their colony. Wasps will warn each other of potential danger and mark useful resources for the rest of the hive using these pheromones, creating a network of information. 
This allows them to work in perfect harmony, defend their homes, find food, and build nests as a team. The teamwork on display in a wasp colony that helps them survive the harsh realities of nature motivated some researchers to develop a similar system, but with 3D printers and drones. Inspired by Mike Hansel's seminal work, Built by Animals, which examines how different animals build structures in the wild, a team of researchers from Imperial College London and EMPA set out to create their own collective construction system called Aerial Additive Manufacturing. Researchers developed a multi-robot framework of pathfinding and 3D printing that can build architectural structures from scratch in a matter of hours. These 3D printing drones work together as a swarm to get the job done as quickly as possible with little human intervention. Much like the WASP Society, these drones are split into casts. Bill drones extrude material from a simple 3D printing system attached to them and build walls layer by layer. And scan drones use a real-time model predictive control system to measure the output and provide information to the rest of the swarm to help the drones decide on the next step. Unlike their more popular and considerably more friendly cousins, bees, who use their own wax to build nests, wasps rely on external resources to build their homes. They can chew up wood, mix it with their saliva, and create paper pulp, which solidifies when it gets dry. The material they use is relatively durable, surprisingly light, and can withstand harsh weather conditions, as it is waterproof. In a similar fashion, build drones use either a foam or a cement-like mixture as material. The viscous mix gets extruded through the print head attached underneath the drone. If one build drone runs out of material, another picks up where it left off to save time, making these drones efficient and fast builders. In a proof-of-concept print, these drones were able to build a 2-meter cylinder using 72 layers of the material. In times when so many countries are struggling with overpopulation, AI-aided automated construction can be the solution to the current housing crisis. By making construction faster and cheaper, 3D printing drones can help solve so many of these issues. They can also help the defense industry in the near future in a number of ways. 3D printing drones have the potential to make remote construction in war zones possible, reducing the number of casualties in the process. Admittedly, 3D printing drones still need human supervision to function properly at the moment. Engineers will have to improve on the current build drone and scan drone designs before they can start being used in the construction industry reliably. But with the recent advancement in AI and improvement in drones, it's only a matter of time before technology catches up with the vision.